welcome to New York City's Central Park. It's one of my favorite places in New York City because there's so much history here. In its 843 acres, there are places that aren't usually in the guidebooks. And today we're going to explore a few of those places as we zigzag around this park. I'm Ariel with Urbanist, and let's explore Central Park and its secrets. Now, before we continue, we have to go look at the light posts because every single light post in Central Park has this four digit number. This is a GPS guide system before there ever was GPS or cell phones. Number, the first two numbers represent the street we're on. So we are aligned right now with 60th Street. The last two numbers, if they're even, they represent that we're going more east. If they're odd, like this one, one nine, and the higher the odd number means the more west we are. So we're on the west side of 68th Street. That way you can get around without using a map or without using a phone. So how did Central Park get its start? Well, for that, we have to go back 450 million years. Oh yeah, we're going to the very beginning. Because that's how old this rock is. Umpire Rock, also known as Rat Rock. The cool thing about this rock is that that's what's underneath New York City. Most of New York City is, has a layer of bedrock that allows major construction projects throughout the entire island. But there's another cool secret about this rock. Let's take a closer look. More than 13,000 years ago, there was the Younger Dryas. It was a period of rapid melting of the glaciers. New York City used to be covered in glaciers taller than the Freedom Tower. However, when those glaciers melted, they left these marks over here, these striations. These are the very markings of the rapidly melting glaciers. Central Park is famous for its winding pathways and it's done on purpose because at the time in the 1850s the popular gardens of France and England were very geometrical and symmetrical. Frederick Law Olmsted and Calvert Vox, the two head designers of the park, wanted to do something that was more akin to going to the Appalachian or Adirondack Mountains. Thus they made every single pathway winding and curvy and going in different directions. That's why sometimes you can get lost in Central Park. However, there's one straight path in the entire park. William Shakespeare introduces us to this uh, part of the park. It is the Central Park Mall, the only straight pathway in the entire park. Thing that makes Central Park unique compared to the European parks is that there are structures embedded into the design of the park itself. Almost all the structures are designed by Calvert Vox, one of the head two designers, and he hired Jacob Ray Mould to make the carvings for this area, Bethesda Terrace. There's some interesting designs. Here we see an owl and a bat, but there's one little secret design that most people don't know about. If you go on the eastern side, you'll see a witch with a jack-o'-lantern. Now, Jacob Ray Mould was infamous for making these funny little carvings. No one knows exactly why he made it. However, one theory is that he either was honoring the Irish immigrants that came to New York or was making fun of them, or maybe a little bit of both. Because the Irish Amer immigrants that came to America brought in the celebrations that we now are familiar today with Halloween, dressing up and collecting candy.
this is the arcade underneath Bethesda Terrace. It's one of the most romantic spots in all of Central Park, at least in my opinion, possibly of even the entire city. Now, highly recommend when you're coming over here to look up because we see the only example of Victorian tiling on the ceiling. Also, there's always amazing musicians playing around and you constantly see people taking their wedding photographs here. Absolutely magical place. It's also beautifully lit up at night. This is Bow Bridge. It wasn't a part of the original plans for Central Park. However, they did it last minute in order to connect Bethesda Terrace to our next stop, the Rambles. This bridge was also cast iron, so it's one of the very few cast iron bridges in New York City, as opposed to a city like London, which has many, many more. Uh, and here we are viewing the lake. The lake is famous for its rowboats, which at normal times you can row during the day currently because this is the pandemic is closed. These are one of the many boat landings that are all around the lake. You used to be able to land in any of the boat landings before, but now you have to only land and depart from the Loeb Boathouse. However, why are there so many turtles in Central Park? Well, they're actually not indigenous to New York City at all. The reason we have so many turtles was that in the 1900s, they were a very popular pet. However, when you buy them as a little baby turtle, they're like this tiny, but they grow and they grow even more. So the people who bought these turtles, usually for their little kids, end up having to buy a bigger tank and an even bigger tank and an even bigger tank. It was way too costly, so many of those families let free the turtles in Central Park. This is the densest area of all Central Park. It's called the Rambles, and you will get lost here. However, fret not, after 15 minutes of wandering around, you'll eventually find your way out. And most pathways lead directly to Belvedere Castle, which is, oh, just so you wait for that. Over 230 different species of birds pass right through Central Park every single year. It is one of the most popular bird watching spots in the entire city. So where are we right now? We are at 75th Street, 75th Street and 31, which is an odd number. We're more west. Hidden inside the rambles and what used to be a tiny little pathway leads directly to a cave. It is believed that this cave was used by the Lenape Native Americans as a place of shelter. However, the cave is currently sealed. But why? Well, the reason it's sealed was throughout the 1920s, especially during the Prohibition era and the rise of organized crime, Many acts of heinous crimes were committed right in this cave. I'd rather not explain them, but it was such a bad place that they decided to seal it.
Wait a minute, why is there a random cottage in the middle of Central Park? Well, this was actually built in Sweden in 1875. But in 1877, they brought it from Sweden over here to Central Park. It functions as a marionette theater. However, during World War II, it was actually the headquarters for civil defense. Just in case the Nazis actually end up invading and they, the civilians couldn't access the military, this was the headquarters. Right next door, we have the Shakespeare Garden. The Shakespeare Garden has all the different flowers mentioned in various Shakespeare plays, and you'll see them marked as we go along. Wow, look at this orange one. So that's Urbanus Orange for all of you. We love it. Whenever I hear music in Central Park, I have to follow it. I hear jazz in the distance, let's check it out. For our last and final stop, we're not really gonna be able to see anything per se. This is what used to be called Seneca Village. It was rediscovered just about two decades ago as they were doing repairs to this area Central Park. Seneca Village was a neighborhood made by freed African slaves here in New York City during the 1800s. However, New York City wanted to build a grand park. There were many different plans for what would be Central Park. One of them was to build it on the East River, uh, where we know modern day like Kipps Bay area. And then the other plan was to make it more in where modern day Riverside Park is. However, they end up deciding right in the middle of Manhattan. The thing is, there was a village of more than 300 African Americans who lived here. And there were even a few Irish who lived with them. They were middle class by all means and lived in pretty good standards. And also they were fully self-sufficient. So they didn't depend on going downtown to get any types of goods. However, they wanted to build the park here anyway. Thus, the city ended up making a smear campaign, publishing in the news that Seneca Village was a shantytown filled with derelict houses about to crumble down in horrid, cramped conditions. It had to be torn down. At least that's what they told the public that lived mostly below 23rd Street at that time. They supported the city and thus they raised Seneca Village down to the ground. Many of the African-American families, their community was ripped apart and they were put in different housing projects around the city. It's a very sad tale and there's barely any remnants except for a few stone blocks that mark the foundations of their houses. That goes to show, it serves as a reminder that even though we have this beautiful park, it does sometimes come at a cost. There are many other places to visit in Central Park, such as Strawberry Fields, the Cleopatra's Needle, and even the American Revolution remnants that are in the northern part of the park. If you want me to visit these places and show them to you, let me know if you want part two down in the comments. I'm Ariel with Urbanist. Thank you so much for watching. Keep being awesome and always keep on exploring. Have a great day, everyone.